commanding presence, I suppose. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks uh, for your punctuality. Um, we're moving into the real, well, we've already started really uh, quite a bit on the meat of uh, the conference uh, and already had some great discussions. Um, let me introduce myself first. I'm Steve Edwards, and I'm with the Business and Biodiversity Program at uh, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, based in Switzerland. Uh, and I have the pleasure of chairing this session today. Um, it's going to be a very interesting session. Uh, both Carrie and Michael will set the stage for how uh, session two and then later session five, uh, which follows this one in the afternoon, are structured to be related. Um, and so I, I won't delve into those details. Uh, but my role here really is to make sure that we keep going along at a good clip and that uh, we've got uh, our presenters all ready to go. And then um, I'll do my very best to guide the discussions afterwards. And, uh, and judging by uh, the, the many rich discussions we had this morning, there's a lot of appetite for people to ask questions and give comments. And that's very welcome. And that's the intent behind the way this is set up. So I will uh, turn it over to Carrie. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to make sure that you turn off your cell phones uh, because of the interference that it causes with the microphone systems. Thanks so much. Carrie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Michael and I put together a few slides to set some broad context because, as Steve mentions, we've got companion sessions. Both this session and session five are all about... Um, preparing a no-net loss system. And they both concern relatively early stages, and this one is about the initial scoping and design <coughs> phases. As you probably gathered, there are lots of governments around the world that are starting to think about this, and although the concept of no-net loss and biodiversity offsets may be pretty new, they're not really coming at it from a carte blanche. There's already all sorts of law and policy relevant to conservation and environmental impact assessment and so on that's there. So I think the theme of this introductory presentation that Michael and I will make is um, about the scoping stage. And that's to really act as a little introduction to these two sessions, two and five. And then everything else that happens in the session is going to be about landscape level planning. But before we dived into different aspects of landscape level planning, we thought it might be helpful just to give that broader context that it fits into. <clears throat> So typically, governments might go through a number of different steps. Um, essentially, a fact-finding and review. Why would you start to set up something new if you don't know what you've already got in place that could help you or that might, in fact, hinder you? So it's a little bit of a stock-taking. The first thing is to perhaps take a look at what policies are already in place in a given country or a region or even locally that touch on this issue. There was a lot of talk this morning about environmental and social impact assessment, so that's a pretty obvious one. Take a look at the letter of the law there. Does it embrace the entire mitigation hierarchy or part of it? Does it require a no net loss outcome or not? But there are the many other areas of law and policy that are relevant. Planning regulations, a, a pretty obvious one, but also sectoral policies. In a number of governments, it's actually laws on mining and oil and gas that are beginning to integrate these aspects of the mitigation hierarchy, and increasingly in other sectors too, such as agriculture. But then fiscal policies. In some countries, um, governments have thought about having some kind of a tax break for companies that get to no net loss or a net gain. So there's a variety of different things. Um, indigenous people's rights, local community rights, issues of land tenure, judicial issues. And then um, a number of people this morning referred to things that would be not just done at the individual project level, but much more done on a strategic environmental basis, perhaps regional planning or whatever. So we haven't put an exhaustive list here, but I think it's a little bit broader than perhaps some people might think. In, in conversations I've had with countries who are starting to engage, they often think about EIA, and they might perhaps think about their conservation law, protected areas, but they wouldn't necessarily be contemplating the full gamut of law and policy that can be very relevant to known at loss outcomes. Another type of review that it's helpful to do in terms of stock taking is what's the biodiversity basis. A lot of people this morning um, talked about sound science and the necessity of resting this on information about the status and trends of biodiversity. Um, and there are lots of things that can be done there. And I think we'll hear about some of those because they tend to be 
front and foremost with landscape level planning. But classification and mapping of habitat types and condition, thinking at the species population and viability levels and conservation status, what's going to be your basis in terms of science for this principle that we heard mentioned earlier on, <coughs> like for like, or like for like or better? What's the biodiversity data that we need to establish that? Um, what kind of baselines, you know, no net loss compared to what? What are the trajectories? What's the scientific baseline for that? Um, if the idea is to accomplish no net loss, then the question is, um, how can you tell how significant a particular impact is? And not just looking at the a little microcosm of an individual project, but raising your head and thinking, what's the regional significance of this loss, which comes back to landscape level planning? So these are just some of the types of um, biodiversity data and maps that it's really useful to check what you've already got because quite often countries have a lot of this data and mapping for a variety of other purposes and it can be extremely relevant in the question of no net loss planning. We've talked a little bit about the existing policy framework. We've talked about biodiversity data and mapping. Another facet is to review human and institutional capacity. <coughs> As you can see here, there's a, a whole gamut of different types of capacity. Um, policy and land use, marine planning, are there people in government at different levels who are starting to do that? Regulatory and legal capacity, we heard this morning from some people in countries with quite developed systems. There's quite an elaborate governmental system, federal, state, and so on, running this. Um, what's, the, what's the existing team that's going to do that? Is it going to be a new dossier on the desk of the people who do EIA or planning? Is it going to mean more work? Do we need to train more people? That kind of thing. Um, we've talked a bit about biodiversity science. Um, a challenge that seems to me to be endemic is coordination within government. Um, this doesn't work so well if we're working um, just with ministries of environment. It really needs to embrace planning, finance, sectoral, um, ministries like oil and gas, mining, agriculture, fisheries. So a, a facet of this for this capacity question is what are the mechanisms for coordinating and bringing those groups together to work on the topic? Um, information technology, it's partly cross-cutting with the science slide just before, but good databases and good spatial planning is, is really critical. Do, are people ready? Can they do that GIS planning? Do we have that in place or would this be a, a, a facet of training and capacity building to be able to run no net loss systems at the national level? And then of course field assessments. It may be done by government staff at a central, provincial, local level, or it may be done by the community of impact assessment professionals. So it's a good idea just to have a quick take stock of what the existing capacity is in, in countries and what these people are doing now um, in order to think about what kind of system would be needed to put these lovely ideals on paper into a real context integrated into planning systems. Michael, do you take a, oh, one more slide for me, I think. <laughs> um, so then just another point is cost-benefit. We just talked a second ago about the idea of integrating policy so it doesn't rest purely in environment ministries but engages mining and oil and gas and planning and finance. Well, um, here in England and in various other countries, there's been a process of looking at the potential impact to the economy of policy. So when policies are drafted, can you think who might be the winners and losers? Who would, be the, who would bear costs of this? Who would be the beneficiaries? How would that be distributed? What are the implications in economic terms of introducing um, an environmental policy? So um, doing some kind of cost-benefit analysis of how this would play out um, with the different actors is, is not a bad idea. Um, <coughs> not least because probably you're going to need the consensus of those actors to get them on board and have the system running well. So understanding the implications for them and having that part of the um, consultation process leading up to the formulation of policies, not a bad idea. Right, I think I hand over to Michael at this point. Okay. Okay. Should I go and sit down no, again? It's <laughs> better to introduce you than yourself. <laughs> well, I'm Michael Crow, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, go on, tell them what you did before you retired. Go on, tell them. <laughs> <laughs> you were in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got three minutes, Kerry. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to skip over pilot projects and the, um, um, the landscape 
land use planning point there because um, that's really the subject of the rest of the session, so I won't address that. But um, the, the last point there about the context of, uh, of no net loss biodiversity offsetting within the, the, the larger portfolio of, of uh, conservation efforts that a government might be undertaking I think is important. And um, it's useful to remind ourselves that um, phrases like no net loss and net gain can actually apply at different levels. So um, a government may have a net gain target for its, its overall biodiversity effort um, and also may have a, a biodiversity offset scheme. But the, the biodiversity offsetting of itself is not going to achieve the, the overall goal of net gain or no net loss. Um, so I think that's an, a, an important clarification. The other uh, thing there that's sometimes worth uh, a government reflecting on in terms of this, its, its overall uh, effort is that um, there can be learnings from other parts of their program that can feed into um, the biodiversity offsetting if, if that's the scheme that they're looking to, to um, set up. Um, I know in Victoria where I came from that we had a um, uh, basically a, a grants program for, um, for biodiversity improvement that was run through an auction scheme and we took um, a lot of useful lessons about uh, metrics, field assessment and contracts out of that program and applied them when we were considering uh, the offsetting scheme. So this can be a, another good reason why you want to uh, look at the bigger picture uh, at, at when you, as one of your first steps. Okay, so um, the uh, second slide here is, is looking at getting down to the nitty gritty of when you're um, considering a biodiversity offsetting scheme. At a higher level, there'll be um, a number of policy options that um, needed to be sorted out somewhere near the start. So is it going to be a voluntary scheme or is it going to be regulated? Um, what's the scope of the scheme? Does it just deal with major projects that might come through the EIA system or is it dealing with um, a larger number of projects uh, perhaps further down in the planning system? And the answer to that, that question, for example, might depend upon well, where are the impacts being felt? Is it um, you know, a small number of big projects that are creating the impacts, or is it death by a thousand cuts where you've got a whole lot of small projects that you need to, to address? Um, the, the question of how are offsets going to be delivered is an important one at this stage. Uh, is it going to be perhaps through the creation of new protected areas? Are you looking at conservation banks, looking at a credit scheme or um, on-site um, offsets? So the, that sorting that out will have a big influence on the subsequent shape of your, of your offset scheme. Now, um, the actual design of the system, that's really a list of um, some of the, the typical elements that will have to be addressed when you get down to designing the system. Uh, I won't go through those in detail. There, many of those things have been and will be discussed uh, later on in the, in the conference. Um, but I did want to make a couple of observations about how you go about designing the system. Um, and I think the first one I want to mention is this question of high standards and quality. In other words, you could, you could design a system that had all those elements and it may not work very well, it may not be effective, it might suffer from a number of problems about the actual delivery and persistence of your offsets. So this is um, picking up on that word design. Uh, there's good design and there's ordinary design. So what are some of the ways in which you might actually pursue good design? Well, I think a good starting point would be the BBOP principles. Have a look at those. How, how would they be incorporated into the system? You could also have a look at the BBOP standard and perhaps do a, a kind of a, a scenario approach where you say, well, this is the system I'm imagining. If a project came through, how, how would the treatment it gets in our system stack up against the BBOP standard? I mean, if we left anything out, um, 
does it deal with all the main issues there? So that can be a, a useful exercise. Um, the other way to pursue good design is through uh, picking up on the experience of uh, existing schemes. So, I mean, we've heard, for example, about the wetland um, <coughs> scheme in the US that's been operating for 30 years. They uh, started off in, in one fashion, they've moved through a number of, of improvements. They've had quite a few learnings over that period and it can be a very um, useful thing to go and pick up some of those lessons and uh, apply them. Uh, some things work, some things don't. So, um, you know, we, we kind of have a feeling now that payment in lieu perhaps works some places, doesn't work everywhere. So you get a bit of a, a feel for uh, what's good practice. No, no scheme is the same, um, no context is the same, but there are lessons that, that can be learnt. So um, I just um, finish on this uh, point about consultation with stakeholders. In some senses, it's, it's a sort of a, a thing we always think to do, and particularly when you're looking at, at the, um, the policy elements of a scheme, you would want to talk to the major stakeholders and get their input and um, uh, shape something that's, that's going to uh, work well from their point of view. However, the other uh, reason I think that uh, consultation is useful is particularly if you are talking to the users of your scheme, which will usually be the developers and people who may be on the supply side of the offsets. And to get inside their heads and to understand where they are in terms of um, their appreciation of, of all these elements will be a big help to design the scheme so that on day one when you open for business and a developer walks in and says, I want to make an application, a permit application, um, what's going to happen? And is what happens uh, an efficient and practical response? So um, are you going to be able to deal with, with those applications in a time? Is the transaction costs that uh, developers face, is that going to be reasonable? Um, so, um, on the other side, on the, on the supply side, um, you'll often find that um, you know, landholders, for example, if they're um, third party landholders, if they're involved in supplying offsets, that um, they'll, be, they'll have this question of risk very much in their mind. You know, are, they, um, are you giving them a fair um, approach in terms of the risks that they might have to take? So. Um, uh, I will finish there, and I think we've probably done our time. And um, yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kerry and Michael, for setting the stage. Um, Go sit down because I'd like to see the presentations. I'm going to have them call up the next presentation just to make sure I have the right order here. Uh, it's outside of my control what comes up on this screen here beyond uh, the buttons that are pushed from here. So. Um, we're going to take heed of some of the things that we heard earlier this morning. Abraulia Diaz talked a lot about the importance of uh, the need to focus on developing countries and some of the challenges faced there. And, and this morning we heard a fair bit about some of the challenges faced in Europe and in the UK um, and in the United States. Uh, but we're going to take a Peter Bakker inspired journey today. Uh, so fasten your seatbelts, uh, get out your passports and your shot cards and put your telephones in flight mode um, because we are going to be visiting a number of very interesting countries in the next hour. Uh, to kick it off, we'll have Bruce McKinney, uh, who's the director of the Development by Design program in the Nature Conservancy. I won't say uh, anything more about Bruce because it's actually in the program and you can read all about it uh, and Google his picture. Um, but uh, if you could come up, Bruce, and start us on our journey to Mongolia, the United States, and Columbia, I believe. Sure. Is there any way to dim these lights a little bit? I doubt you can see the PowerPoint very well. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe not. No technical people here? All right. Light switch. Um, all right. Well, I'll do the best we can here. Um, so I titled my program, uh, my presentation, From Bandages to Blueprints, and uh, 
So I want to start off by apologizing um, because I know that here in England I should, probably should have said from plasters to blueprints. So any cultural insensitivity, sorry about that. Um, what you see in the slide, if you can see the slide, is um, this is mountains in the east coast of, uh, or in the eastern part of the United States where shale development is happening, shale gas. And um, that's a well pad. There's another well pad in the distance. This is what's happening very rapidly in the U.S. right now. It's uh, what the future of energy development's looking like. And it's probably coming to a region near you soon. Great. But before talking about the future, I wanted to talk about the past a little bit. So this is a region in Wyoming. Uh, and what we did here was we mapped all the producing oil and gas wells over the last 100 years to see what does development look like over time. And I'll just run this. And as you can see, each of these wells is permitted one by one. And probably any single impact doesn't look like a huge deal. But as it comes in over time, it starts to be significant in terms of a cumulative impact to where now you have endangered species in this region. So that's not sustainable development. Uh, I wanted to try and summarize our points in a simple way. It's nothing simpler than ABCs. So. Uh, the idea is that, number one, we want to get ahead of these impacts. We, we have these modeling capabilities now. We have remote sensing data. We have a lot of things we didn't have a decade or two ago for modeling out how development is going to take place in a landscape. And we should be harnessing that when we're doing mitigation. Uh, secondly, we want to be thinking at a regional scale. In a lot of the cases, and we work a lot with energy and mining, um, there's a regional resource base that's being exploited. So you have multiple mining projects or multiple energy projects coming to a region. And likewise, you want to be, for a, for a healthy landscape, we want to be thinking about how to protect, preserve uh, a whole landscape, a whole ecosystem. So we need to be starting at that regional scale. And then third, we want to see a real conservation outcome. And too often right now, mitigation is simply a kind of set of ad hoc actions that are taken for a project that don't necessarily add up to meaningful conservation. And we think that uh, there's a lot of opportunities for the funding that goes into that to be spent better for more meaningful conservation at a scale that matters. And that matters, our ABCs matter because that energy, that mining development is coming to new frontiers around the world. This is Mongolia. Uh, big, wide open spaces, spectacular wildlife like the Hulan, uh, nomadic herding, still one third of the population, their livelihoods depend on nomadic herding. And it's deeply ingrained in the culture of the country. Um, but mining's coming and it's coming fast. Um, Mongolia's one of the most mineral rich countries in the world. Uh, because of that, they were, I think, had the highest GDP in the world a couple of years ago because of mining investment. So the question is, how are we going to balance those different interests? We think landscape level planning can really help. Um, if you think about, this is uh, Mongolia here, um, and at the bottom of the slide is the uh, Gobi region, where a lot of the development's happening. And that one dot is one major mine site that's made a net positive commitment for biodiversity. And if we just think about that site doing a project level offset, um, it looks like there's lots of opportunity when you don't think of it in terms of the future development, which about 40% of the country is under lease for mining. So we need to be thinking about if we want an offset that's gonna persist over time, we wanna be developing that in the context of the future development. So the Nature Conservancy is working with the government of Mongolia, uh, other partners it's through a stakeholder process um, to develop that kind of landscape blueprint. And we started in the grasslands region, uh, moved to the Gobi, and now completing the country with uh, funding support from the government um, that's trying to look at where are the most important places for conservation in the context of that development. That's not saying that areas outside of the green, the green is kind of the conservation portfolio, the important places. The places outside of that have value too, connectivity is important, but if we're trying to get to the government's goal of 30% protection, uh, what are the most important places? 
So I want to dive down a little bit into that map now. This is the Gobi region and talk a little bit why, about why landscape level planning is so important. If you look uh, at the map here, the green is the conservation portfolio. It includes existing protected areas, new potential uh, sites for conservation as well. And that's 30% of the Gobi. Um, then you can see that also the areas in uh, red are active mines and the other areas are potential future mines. What, what you can do when you're looking at conservation in the context of development and taking those interests into account is that you can try to develop a conservation portfolio that conserves the values but is to the extent possible bending around some of the development that you expect uh, may happen. So that's number one. When you do that, you can identify the points in that landscape proactively before it hap all happens. Where might there be conflicts between, in this case, mining development and the conservation goals that you have? This is a first step in, number one, thinking in the future, what do we need to do? And also gives you a basis for starting to think about that avoid decision that we talked about so much this morning. What's a science-based way of thinking about that? Uh, what areas, and using systematic conservation planning, what areas are irreplaceable within this portfolio? Some of them you're going to say the development should not happen there. You can also incorporate other values into landscape planning. So here, this is a, a herder camp data that was used to understand where is nomadic herding happening across this landscape. That helps you understand uh, both in terms of determining your conservation portfolio, but also kind of what the management status of those areas might be, multi-use for grazing, for wildlife, et cetera. Landscape planning also supports national policies and compliance with the lending standards that we've all heard about performance standard six. Um, so different policies, standards will be asking for, are these projects happening in critical habitat, natural habitat, modified habitat? We need to be thinking about that at the right scale, and it's the landscape scale. So using landscape planning allows, provides that lens for then working through those policies and standards. And lastly, in the case here, landscape planning can help you have a, a vision for what does sustainable development look like in this region. So this is a little bit of a cartoon, it's not real, but over time, I'll animate this, uh, you can see how offsets from mining could be driven to the conservation portfolio, the places that matter for conservation the most, ensuring that we're getting the biggest bang for the buck out of our mitigation dollars here, out of the offset dollars. And over time, you ideally have mining that's happened in the right ways in the right places, but you also have a secured conservation, 30% uh, in this case protected area system that's funded and effectively managed. So I'm going to close with this. Uh, really a, a word of optimism. I think maybe it's just an NGO thing, but we tend to beat ourselves up a bit. And, you know, if you think about where this has come, uh, certainly in my organization, the the term mitigation hierarchy was a big yawn for a long time, but now everybody says it all the time. Maybe they still yawn, I don't know. Um, but we've had, you know, there's been a lot of success and progress in Mongolia. We've also been working in a couple other places that Steve mentioned. I didn't have time to talk about them today too much, but I'll just touch on them. Colombia has adopted a new policy for compensatory mitigation that moves from essentially counting trees and replanting really any kind of tree you want to, to one that's ecosystem-based and landscape-based. It's much more comprehensive. It still needs to be implemented well, but it's much better on the books than it was. And in the U.S., I think particularly exciting over the last several months, uh, Secretary Jewell of the Department of Interior, that's the department that manages about a fifth of the lands in the U.S., all our public lands, issued her first secretarial order and it was on improving mitigation in a landscape context. So the central plank of this is all about landscape level planning and balancing the conservation and development goals on those public lands. So I think that's uh, uh, really positive things that are happening, not just in the work that TNC is doing, but I think you'll hear about in the other projects at this meeting. So I, I want to say thanks to everybody in the room, because I know people are working hard on this subject all the time, and we've got some momentum on this, and let's keep it going.
Thanks for your time. Um, just to, if, well, except, if, are there any questions for, I don't know why I'm holding this one, it's not on, but. Um, this works, right? Are there any questions uh, just <laughs> of a clarification nature for Bruce? Just clarification. Okay. Uh, let me try and figure out how this Hi, Bruce. It's Dave Richards here from hey, a long time ago. <clears throat> That's one sector. Are there any other sectors in Mongolia that might overprint another set of priorities on that very elegant analysis? Yeah, I mean, if you mean in, in other landscapes where we work, there may be more types of impacts coming to, and we would want to consider all those major impacts. In, in Mongolia, it's really right now about mining and the infrastructure associated with that, railroads, roads, et cetera. There's overgrazing too in some of those herding areas, but those are the major major ones, and we tried to incorporate that. It's, it's Lorraine Brown Lorraine. here from Shell. How did you delineate the conservation areas versus the areas for mining? Mm -hmm. One of the issues we have in Alberta, Canada, is the government has an obligation to develop the resources, and so they won't give up any areas for, you know, they won't put aside areas that are not going to be developed. We actually have an obligation as a province to develop those resources. So even if we give them back, even if we give our rights back, they are then obligated to sell them again to another party who might conclude the same thing that we have, that you know we don't want to develop that, but they have this obligation. And how did you get around that with the Mongolia government? Well, in the case of Mongolia, um, the government has a 30% protected areas goal. They've actually already, based on the work in the grasslands, uh, a million hectares have been designated into a protected area. Uh, they're talking about no mining zones, um, natural and cultural heritage sites. So I think they, it's a different situation. The, 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 it's all state land and they want to have those protected areas. The problem you're discussing, I think we do have in the U.S. too on our public lands. Um, there's a, and, and a lot of places have that. Um, all I can say is we're working right now in the U.S. with um, the Bureau of Land Management around how do you create durable offsets on public lands when there is that multiple use um, obligation. Um, I think if you're thinking about multiple use, I'd like to think that conservation is one of those uses and you can make the case for that. But I don't know the Canadian situation well enough. But it is an issue. Each country is going to have its own context. Great. Thanks so much, Bruce. So if we could uh, move to the next uh, set of slides, please. Uh, and we're waiting for uh, Joe Bull from Imperial College to come up here. I uh, do want to recognize that... Uh, that Toby Gardner from uh, SEI is helping as a rapporteur today. Uh, and we also have some support from Rachel. I can't see your last name from here. I couldn't read it from here anyways. Um, if I could see it, uh, is helping us as timekeeper. And that's actually a message more for the panel than it is for the audience. Um, and uh, Joe is going to be keeping us on the Asian continent and taking us to Uzbekistan. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you very much to Carrie and everyone else in Bebop for having, a, having us here. It's a privilege to be part of this conference. So I'm going to quickly talk about, I spent the last few years working in Uzbekistan, um, helping them build the basis for biodiversity, um, implementing a biodiversity mitigation hierarchy. And I'm just going to, in my nine minutes, or seven minutes, or however long I've got, um, ten minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the scientific basis, um, building the scientific basis for doing this kind of known at last policy, well, in Uzbekistan. Um, I think one thing I'm going to focus on a little bit based on the, the talk this morning is the difference, I think, between no net loss and, and a net gain. And I'm not sure how much attention has been paid to the, the gap between no net loss and a net gain. So that's something I'll touch upon, especially as a theme of my talk as it came up this morning. So um, this, is, this is where uh, Uzbekistan is in the world, for those who don't know. Um, and in the, uh, the, the area I've been focusing on, there was kind of a, a GEF-funded project to say, how do we bring biodiversity into consideration into the oil and gas sector? So there's a pilot kind of policy development project going on in that far northwest area, which I've blown up here, which is called the uh, Ustiat Plateau. And that's the basis for, for policy development uh, of, of no net loss in the, in the region. 
Um, so one thing that I've been looking at a lot and that my colleagues in Uzbekistan have been looking at a lot is, uh, is the context for this, you know, that, and that especially environmental change. And that's something that um, Kerry mentioned, baselines and counterfactuals, and it's a, it's a crucial issue when trying to think about no net loss, obviously. Uh, no net loss against what? Um, and so I just put up a few images here to give you an idea of the kind of analyses we've tried to do to understand the counterfactual in, in the region. So in the top left there, um, I'm not sure how well you can see that on the screen, actually, but um, that's uh, the, that northwest region. And um, we've taken 10 or 12 years of satellite imagery and looked at the change in vegetation cover, essentially, over that time. Um, and without going into the details of it, you can see that um, there's kind of a, a pink tinge, and that's because there's a very kind of rapid ongoing desertification of the region. That's in part to do with the, the green area in the top right is the Aral Sea, um, which has almost disappeared entirely for a host of other reasons. Um, so what you've got, in, this is the context for this kind of biodiversity conservation work there, is that there's this hugely degrading habitat, basically. Um, and added to that, which is a historical thing, um, in the bottom right here, this is mean winter temperature over a period of the last uh, 20 years, which, um, based on my line of best fit, which may not be perfect, is, um, is trending upwards, which you'd expect under climate change scenarios. So remember that any biodiversity compensation we're doing in the region is, is in, a, in a landscape that's rapidly degrading for all kinds of other reasons which have nothing to do with industry whatsoever. Other moving targets in the region are these guys, the saiga antelope. Um, so the saiga antelope is the main kind of conservation target species in the region. Um, and as you can see from the, the graph on the bottom left, they're not doing particularly well. Um, so that, that's kind of a 95% crash in the last 20 years in their population abundance. Um, and they're a highly mobile species. So in the top left, we've got kind of where they've been over the last six or so years in, in the country. And I put this up for a couple of reasons. One is because, as I say, I've been trying to help with develop uh, no net loss as a policy in, in Uzbekistan. And even just a couple of years ago, I was speaking to someone in the office, and they said, so how much do we, these are the saiga antelope, this is the, one of the main conservation target species that's critically endangered. They said, how much does it cost an oil and gas company to kill a saiga antelope? I was like, mm, it's not really what we're going for, actually. That's not really the, that's not really the aim of this kind of no loss policy. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff to get around, the philosophy behind doing this. But also, this is a highly, you know, again, this is something that they're looking to conserve through the biodiversity, through the mitigation hierarchy, um, and it's changing rapidly. So in the top left, that's a seasonal uh, map of, of locations of saiga antelope. Um, they're meant to be there in, in the winter, which is the blue dots, which is where they've been seen in the winter, but they're not meant to be there in the summer, which is all the red dots. So that's that, they're changing their distribution completely, we think, because of climate change and other factors. So, you know, these, these kind of things that are changing anyway, and we have to somehow think about how to achieve no net loss when things are changing so rapidly. The next question I asked when I was there, one of the first questions was where is all, or, you know, remember oil and gas sector, where is all the oil and gas infrastructure, where are the locations, um, what are the impacts that it has based on your EIA process? And they said, no, no don't know, we can't tell you. Um, so again, part of this developing policy is, is to get a landscape idea of where all this kind of, where all these impacts are and what the impacts actually are, which I think, Bruce, you talked a bit about with your talk. And what we found out, and I'm not going to go into the details in my nine minutes, um, which may be a lot shorter now, um, is um, we did a lot of surveys to find out what the actual spatial impact is of oil and gas infrastructure, and found out that they really don't actually impact, you know, and, and certainly in terms of roads, pipelines, all the kind of linear infrastructure, it only results in a very small area of the lands of habitat actually being cleared. Um, and then if you, if you map that over the Stuart Plateau as a whole, which is what we've done on the right here, you find out that what you've got from, in terms of actual land use changing, area being cleared, habitat being cleared, it's something like 0.2% of the entire plateau. So that's something else I want to make a point about. You know, with this offset policy it, that's being implemented here, we're talking about 0.2% of the landscape being cleared for industrial development. That's, that's not very much, right? I mean, that's a tiny amount. And I think the key thing there is that, again, someone mentioned it in the plenary earlier, um, offsets should not be given too much attention. Because if we're offsetting damages, then you know, it, it's, it needs to be part of a much bigger suite of biodiversity conservation measures. <clears throat> so this is a slide that people always enjoy a little bit, and I wish I could give all the theoretical background to how we did this. But having got the, those data saying, you know, this is the impact of the oil and gas industry, this is where it is, this is how much habitat is cleared, we then said, what if you take a number of different biodiversity offset methodologies from around the world and apply them to that and say, what would be the requirements in terms of habitat restoration? And then if you add that, what's your net loss or net gain or whatever? So on this graph, that's what we've done. And no net loss would be right down the middle. And this is the kind of spread you get over a 40-year period from the, applying these different biodiversity offset methodologies to the same set of data. 
Um, I'm not suggesting that some are worse than others, it's just a case of whether they're appropriate. But, um, but one thing I want to make a point about here is that I mentioned the difference between no net loss and net gain. And um, <laughs> I was speaking to someone recently and they kind of said, um, so no net loss, we can see that's quite difficult to achieve. But once you've achieved that, right, net gain is not actually that difficult, is it? Right? If, you, if you need to plant 100 trees because you've lost 100 trees, if you plant 101 trees, net gain. <laughs> Again, not quite the way it works. Because with this, if you're trying to achieve no net loss, you're actually um, having to overcome all the uncertainties that go with your restoration efforts and with your impacts in the first place and with the, the uncertainties in your methodology. Um, the uncertainty bands on this show that um, even with a very high-performing biodiversity outcome methodology, like the one at the top there, um, because of uncertainty with compliance, for instance, you could be right down at the bottom near no net loss. So to achieve no net loss, you're actually having to do a lot more than um, <coughs> replace exactly your, your losses. And um, so to achieve net gain is an entirely different thing. Again, I'm not sure how we, we make the difference between net, no net loss and a net gain. And finally, um, on that, um, so we looked at uh, out-of-kind offsetting. So um, the talk this morning, there was a comment that we should uh, offset should only be like for like, which is a, a kind of, seems as though it's one of those relatively well-held tenets, but increasingly, I think, um, seeing people try and do really out-of-kind offsetting because it gets a much better result for conservation in some areas. So I'm not sure if you can see, um, again, the colours here, but this, this map on the right here, again, is the same as Stuart Plateau, and we said... In, okay, if we're doing strict like-for-like -like offsetting or strict like-for-like -like no net loss, um, we'd basically restore all that kind of grass, the kind of shrubby lands that we've lost through clearance for oil and gas infrastructure and so forth. That, that's what we've lost. So strict like-for-like -like would be replacing 0.2% of the plateau and restoring habitat, which is great. I mean, that's, that's kind of strict no net loss. But actually, if instead, you know, again, because that's 0.2% of the plateau, is that really what we want as a conservation outcome? Instead, if we say... We're going to take and aggregate all that, that um, the funding, the conservation funding we get from those losses and put them into a protected area up here in the top right, that red area, um, to protect the saiga antelope and the kind of the habitat that they're um, the flagship species for, then potentially that's a much better conservation outcome. Because if we don't do that, they are going to disappear. There's no question about that whatsoever. So, um, and just, yeah, to compare that to the map on the left, that's just a map of conservation priorities, which we worked on um, in Tashkent to, with the kind of Academy of Sciences. And just to show that you can map conservation priorities developed by out-of-kind offsets on, um, across to that quite directly. So again, I think this is relevant from the point of view of no net loss versus net gain. Philosophically, they're very different things. I think if we want no net loss, then we'd, we want to do things like biodiversity offsetting and so forth. If we want a net gain, we're not really doing offsetting. We're using a kind of a mitigation hierarchy type approach to leverage conservation funding, which is a very different thing entirely. So I think we need to talk and think a lot more about the difference between no net loss and the net gain, and accept that they're very different approaches, actually. Just to wrap up with a few things to toss in. Um, oh, one minute. <laughs> I've missed all the ones in between. Did you, fla did you flash those up? Oh, getting too excited. Um, so I'm just going to throw up a few institutional issues that, that, we, that have uh, particular for the Uzbek case and maybe are interesting in general. Um, so they do have a, a well-established legal framework for environmental impact assessment, which, which but has been in place for a while and is, seems relatively effective. But um, there's not, absolutely nothing there about biodiversity requirements. So that's kind of the first hurdle we, that we've found, and that's what we've done, been doing a lot of work on, is building biodiversity into the kind of existing EIA process. Um, there's also a lot of the projects in the region are co-financed by the IFC and so forth. Joe Tariq talked about IFC performance standards being a game changer. Um, but in, in Uzbekistan, there's as far as we can tell, no capacity to understand or implement IFC performance standards. So this is the kind of thing that you need to, obviously, you know, is a game changer, but we need to get around things like that. Um, the area we're talking about is very near the Kazakhstan border. Um, nothing wrong with Kazakhstan at all, obviously, but that throws up a whole host of interesting issues um, that it's a transboundary problem. For instance, you can't actually get access to it because there's so much political difficulties between the two countries. Um, and also, if you're trying to use a, an out-of-kind offset scheme to kind of preserve the saiga antelope, you can do whatever you like in Uzbekistan, but every uh, summer they go back up to Kazakhstan, and then, you've, then you have no control over them. So can you achieve none at loss if, if, you're, if your target is moving all over the place and so forth? Um, finally, we talk a lot about um, solutions like uh, conservation banking or mitigation banking. Um, there's no private land ownership in Uzbekistan. It's not, it's not, it's not possible. So um, that actually throws a real spanner in the works for implementing something like mitigation banking, so needing to find a different way around that. 
And finally, um, as a result of well-publicized incidents in the mid-2000s, which I won't talk about because they're highly controversial, um, there are no international conservation NGOs in, um, in Uzbekistan either, um, or anything really like that. Uh, Pippa's nodding knowingly down there, because um, FFI tried to get in and, and have found it very, very difficult indeed. Um, and that's difficult in terms of monitoring, independent monitoring of offset projects and actually making sure they're implemented, for instance. So these are the kind of challenges that have been occurring on the ground in, in, in a country like Uzbekistan. So maybe that's something to come up for discussion later, I'm not sure. So I'm out of time now. Um, that was quite a big condensing of not a few years' work into nine minutes, but uh, thank you very much for your time and I look forward to the discussion. Any uh, clarification questions? Uh... Lorraine Brown with Shell. You mentioned that the um, antelope would disappear if they didn't have some conservation action, but the amount of land that had been taken up by the development was just a very small percentage. Were there, what threats were the antelope suffering from if it wasn't the land that had been taken away? Um, it's almost entirely poaching. So, um, so I can go into, I can talk about this all day, so be careful what you ask, but um, it, it's poaching because uh, for horns and meat. And what, and what happens is they, um, the males tend to clash and, and have a rut every year, and then loads of them die, and you get a few of them left. And then the ones that are left tend to get poached for horn, um, so then there's no males. Um, so the population has crashed largely as a result of that. So that's nothing at all to do with industry. That's just to do with people poaching them. So that's why I'm saying it would be an additional conservation action because you're trying to prevent something happening that would have happened with, with or without industry. Does that answer your question? Or? Uh, Daniel Cressel from Nature Magazine. But thanks for the fascinating talk. You mentioned the area of land was really small, but can you assess the, uh, if you like, how that land's used? So if, you, if it was very small, but a road right across the migration route for an antelope, that could have a much bigger impact. Mm. So is that something that you can or have looked at? So you're right to say that, and we've, we've looked at disturbance effects, for instance, of, of the presence of infrastructure upon things like mammals and birds and so forth, and that's probably larger, well it is larger, but it's, it's still less than 1%. Um, there's other things to consider, for instance water abstraction would be a huge issue in, in this part of the world because it's so arid, um, and other impacts of, of infrastructure. Fragmentation is one that come, get, gets talked about a lot, but I'm not sure it actually has a big impact because these are kind of dirt roads in an area where the, the rest of the landscape is effectively dirt anyway, so it's not like that really causes you know, much fragmentation. So, but there are issues like that to consider, yeah. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so we'll take one more clarification question, and then uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. We'll have space at the end for general discussion, but these are to clarify any aspects about Uzbekistan or Joe's presentation. Thank you. Sure. In, uh, ben Kampala with Total MP Uganda. In your calculation of net gain or no net loss, uh, how would you consider the elimination of, do you consider the elimination of poaching as counting in your favor? which is to say if you initiate the program to reduce the poaching. Mm. Is that something you count, or is it something that's aside? That, I mean, that's something that the authorities are very keen to look at as a, as a way of achieving gains, conservation gains. Um, and I can see the argument, again, for kind of creating an area where there is no poaching, and you can create an equivalency and you know, a metric for saying that equates to that much area of grassland habitat that you've lost. So yeah, I think you can count that as a gain. Whether you call that kind of a no-net loss thing or, or a net gain, which is the distinction I was trying to make, is a different matter. But yes, that, that is what they're keen to do. Great. Thanks okay. so much, uh, Joe. Thanks. So uh, next up in our uh, program, we're going to be going to Namibia with uh, Pippa Howard from FFI. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great privilege to be part of this program. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack, I think. I'm taking you into one of my favorite places in the world anyway, um, into one of the oldest deserts in the world, and actually one of the most biodiverse deserts too. It has incredible endemism, in incredible biodiversity, and it's currently under enormous threat from mining, um, the uranium mining sector particularly. 
I'm going to talk about a proof of concept that FFI is, is developing using um, a landscape level assessment which was heavily contributed to by, um, and, and part well, was run by FFI, but Aaron Parham, one of my colleagues, and Amre uh, Fanaza was actually very, very integral to, we have this landscape level assessment team. And um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about that, but you can see a more detailed uh, presentation on the uh, conference website just to give you a little bit more around how we went about doing that piece of work. So I'm going to kind of cut to the chase. Um, so I want to start at the very beginning, and it's a very good place to start. We had ABCs, and I'm not going to start singing you a song about it. <laughs> but essentially, um, some of the core principles that have to underpin a landscape-level approach to uh, a no net loss or net positive impact have to be, I think, as Kerry and Michael very clearly pointed out, around policy and governance, um, you know, for the policy planning frameworks, etc., and what you can and cannot do, either as a company or as an individual or as a, as a community. There need to be targets, uh, national level targets and conservation. Uh, we have to understand that when we're approaching these kinds of problems and, and looking at development threats, that we need scales that actually mean something on an ecological scale. And I think that's something that has, I haven't heard too much about, is actually understanding the uh, ecological principles, the function, the integrity, the resilience, and really what, it, what, how, what the capacity is of that landscape to actually absorb change and development so that it continue to be uh, sustainably um, productive in the long term. So we really do need to understand what the biodiversity is, what the ecosystems are, what the ecosystem services are. And so having put that all on the plate, we really want to try to develop um, a process using landscape level um, assessment and planning to help us achieve a no net loss situation. So uh, it's quite simple, really. <laughs> the... Um, basic kind of premise really is that we found that there were a number of pretty difficult kind of gaps or at least sort of absences in the current approaches um, which needed to be addressed and we wanted to develop and demonstrate a process for the application of low net loss in the landscape context that had a focus on the process for identifying and prioritizing biodiversity offset options uh, that essentially take into account the existing policy and planning framework. So actually, actually you know, that's, that's one of the sort of first things. But that also has to be set within the socio-economic and political constraints. Um, so what's the harsh reality of, you know, the possibility of actually getting one of these offsets to work in, in a landscape like this? Um, we need to understand the capacity of the country to be able to do that, the capacity of those who are experts to be able to do that. Um, but we need to, and we need to learn from that. So we've got this whole process really to strengthen FFI's position on this, but actually to kind of learn from what we got out of the landscape level assessment in Namibia um, to help provide a platform where we could apply some of these principles and see whether or not they'd work. So here we've got some of the real, real uh, kind of conundrums or essentially some of the challenges that I think were raised this morning, some of them weren't. The mitigation hierarchy isn't fully applied at a landscape scale. We've seen that. It's not often uh, implemented early enough in the whole development process. Bruce very neatly talked about the whole sort of idea of cumulative impact and, and, and looking at strategic environmental assessment needs within a landscape, and that certainly hasn't been done very well. But also, just how the offsets actually feed into the, uh, the, the, the aggregation of conservation opportunities and the integrity of the landscape at a broader scale um, using the existing protected area system, um, but also making sure that the ecological patterns and processes that we understand are actually feeding into the, long, you know, the connectivity, those ecological principles that have to underpin. So we've got you know, unrealistic conservation targets. We sometimes opt optimize what we're trying to do. And if we get too narrowly down into a kind of a species focus, we are often risk what becomes a sort of fragmented um, and very isolated offset patches, which don't actually mean terribly much in the long, longer term, broader conservation uh, objectives. <clears throat> 
sorry, this is all a bit, uh, <laughs> a lot of detail, but it, there, are, there is some really important things that need to be said here. I'm using two principles here, and I'm, I apologise, Mike, for bringing the, the bush broker system up here, but um, we heard this morning about some of the failures of the, in the US uh, wetland system. And there are failures, too, in the, in the bush broker system, not necessarily because the system is wrong, but because sometimes the administration is wrong. But I believe that fundamentally there isn't a proper ecological approach to this, understanding at a landscape scale what is possible and not possible for, in terms of, of achieving low net loss and what can and cannot be offset in those landscapes. But all of this really talks about the underlying need for a better understanding of the patterns and processes which underpin the ecology. I'm an ecologist first and foremost. <laughs> so why did we use Namibia really in terms of, of trying to um, play around with this kind of proof of concept? Not turning things on its head, but trying to tackle some of those issues. We had a fantastic uh, database um, and you know, a long-term study that had, was underpinned by 35 years of, of, of vegetation studies, really good ecologists who understood what was going on. We could map where the vegetation was, where the species were, where the, the ecological processes were happening. And this really meant that we had a fantastic um, platform in which we could start to, to play around with development options. Just as a bit of a context, so those of you who don't know where Namibia is, I'm sorry, I got my pretty pictures coming last after all the words. I promise you there are more pictures now. Um, Namibia has 48% of its land under protection. That's a lot in terms of the global examples. Much of that is under national, uh, national parks. A lot of it is under conservancies, community-run, the community-based natural resource management, and some of it is under private land. Now, there are three kinds of land tenure in this country. There's the, the state, private, and communal. So, you know, it's, it's fairly clear and, and, and uncomplicated from a, from a land um, ownership point of view. But you press uh, very, you know, that, that area, sorry, the, the um, red box is essentially the, the land that we did, the, the area that we did the landscape level assessment on. These are the uranium mining concessions. So a very similar picture to what Bruce showed us in, in Mongolia. This is a massively threatening um, land use. But what we've done through this landscape level assessment, and as I said, you can find detail on that in, in, the, in the presentation online, is that we can understand different scenarios. And what we were able to do, if we removed all of those protected area <coughs> frameworks, all the, all, the, all the lines that drew boundaries between who, which land belonged to, to who, and just started with the ecological patterns and processes, what were the fundamental kind of starting points of, of the ecology in this area, we were able to develop essentially like a heat map. And we didn't do it in, 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 a, in a traffic light mapping, but we actually put it in green to make it a little bit user friend, more user friendly. But the dark green patches are those areas which are essentially irreplaceable, highly vulnerable, and really essential for connectivity and resilience. And we were able to start to put on layers of development um, to understand what the planning process was and what the scenarios were likely to be over a 10 or 15 year period as the mining industry developed. And you've got one scenario on the left and the other on the right. And as you can see, it starts to fragment the landscape enormously, and the footprint is, is huge. If we take it down, and just remember that a lot of this data is actually done at, at a very high resolution. So we've got one, two, three meters squared resolution. So you can actually get really down to the detail on what biodiversity is being impacted on, but more importantly, what patterns and processes are being impacted on. And if we understand what's going on and where the um, where the impacts are happening, we can start to understand where offsets are potentially, um, are, where the potential for offset can be located. So if we, um, if we look at, uh, for example, a Rio Tinto mine, this is the Rossing mine, um, that's the kind of habitat we can get a lot of detail onto that. This is the Lange Heinrich mine. We can start to understand that there are similarities within the landscape where biodiversity features are, are, are able to be identified. And you can start to find like for better, like for like, at an ecological scale um, for, for protection and, and, and aggregation of offsets. This has puts a lot of the other land uses. There were questions around what other land uses were threatening other than mining. And this puts on all sorts of things like farming, 
Um, we have ecotourism, a huge, huge, huge industry in Namibia. Um, the protected areas network is now overlaid with this, and you start to see where the vulnerabilities are, what's, what's possible in that landscape, given the policies and the potential there um, to, to actually set up uh, good landscape level aggregated set, um, offset schemes. So our approach really um, has to, and I'm just going to um, summarize this very clearly because I'm not sure I'm running out of time, is really that you have to under, um, include the patterns and processes. You have to understand what your targets are and, 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 and what the goals are of conservation. We need to keep um, you know, the, the biodiversity and ecosystem services aspects real, and, and we need to understand how that sits within the overall national level planning schemes, and also their, uh, the development objectives of the country. Um, we can't, I don't, and I don't think this has been done particularly well yet, we're not setting the right level of targets, we're not actually often looking at resolution that's clear enough and, 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 and providing enough options. Um, but overall, landscape level assessment and conservation planning gives us a really useful decision support to, to tool to both understand the landscape and to make the right decisions based on ecological fundamental patterns. So, you know, what is the carrying capacity of that land? What, what is the flexibility? How much can a, a landscape take in terms of impact? And that's cumulative impact as well before we start to get the tip, reach tipping points and, and what, what causes collapse in the system. And, to, and unless we actually take that kind of approach, I do think that the offsets that we generate or create are, are not going to be effective and certainly not sustainable. Okay, that's really all I have to say. Um, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Pippa, for that. So again, like last time, specific questions to uh, the case in Namibia or uh, the, the work of FFI. George, you got your hand up over there. Uh, this planning uh, study, is this something that government plans to implement, that you did at the request of government, or is it sort of a theoretical, what's possible, you know, this is how FFI would like to do it? Or, you know, so. So, George, there are two components to that. The um, landscape level assessment um, was actually part of, uh, well, it was a complementary part of the strategic environmental assessment for the Uranium provinces in Namibia. So. The government, under the uh, guidance of the Ministry of Mines and Energy and the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, commissioned the strategic environmental assessment and then later through the funding of the UNDP, FFI completed the landscape level assessment of biodiversity vulnerability and land use. So, you know, the maps that you see here were a product of that and it sits within this overall strategic plan and there is a strategic environmental management plan which actually talks to the, res talks to the results of that SEA. Uh, subsequently, the government has recognized that their whole decision-making process around where um, minerals are and where mine licenses and, and exploration licenses are is conflicting with the ecological values that they have in those landscapes. So there's an enormous amount of conflict, and we could go on all day about this, but tourism is conflicting with mining. Uh, you know, they, Namibia has almost more mines inside national parks now than they have outside. They have uh, a new policy on mining in protected areas. Um, that policy does set high standards and they are looking at no net loss and offsets is certainly part of their, uh, the mantra that comes from, from the Minister of Environment. And so it's an enormously complex part, but you know, what we're trying to, to understand here is using that as a backdrop. So there is a, a government that appears to be willing and they're using this as a decision support tool. Um, how can one make the best of the values that are in the landscape and actually perhaps redraw some of the protected areas because we understand far better now where those values are? Because the artificial, or the, the way the protected areas network was drawn up was actually pretty artificial in the first place, not necessarily protecting the highest values in the system. But that's whole, um, the Minister, Ministry of Mines and Energy is, is understanding that the failure of the Ministry of Environment and Tourism to actually help them veto certain de decisions on the basis of environmental sensitivities um, has um, led to you know, new, a new nationwide um, tool uh, 
which will be at a slightly lower resolution, but will actually help to identify those key hotspots that need to be protected. And that will look at ecosystem services as well as um, biodiversity values. So where, are the, where is the human use value? And in particular here, like in Mongolia uh, and, and in Uzbekistan actually, grazing pastoralism is, is incredibly important and, and the itinerant nature of the people who use that land has to be taken into account. So um, there's a long story to this, but um, it is driven by the government. As, uh, as our uh, final panelists are coming up here, I wanted to, to ask you to start thinking about questions to ask in the remaining, if I could even see the clock because I'm somewhat blinded. Um, yeah, we'll have 10 to 20 minutes depending upon how much uh, I can encroach upon your coffee break. Um, but think about, uh, there, the offset will be more cookies uh, if you'd like. Uh, think about questions for the panel, um, but, but probably not specifics about the individual countries or cases that they've been talking about, but rather questions that are relevant across the board um, so that we can get some of the richness of, of seeing these different presentations. Next up are uh, Kirsten Hoon from the World Bank and Sally Johnson, uh, who is an independent consultant. And they're taking us to Liberia. Yes. I'm going to try to leave my paper here. Good afternoon, and thanks very much for giving us the opportunity to be here. I'll try to, I try to talk for two minutes, and then I'll give the floor to Sally, who has done the real field work. Um, I thought I'd say a few words just on why the World Bank is here, because uh, um, we're first and foremost a development. I mean, our goal is uh, poverty reduction and economic development. Um, so even I have to explain. I and I work for the oil, gas, and mining department as a senior mining specialist. Um, so. Most of the work I do is really to work with governments, helping them to create a favorable investment climate for the mining industry and see how we can get oil, gas, and mining to contribute to economic development. Um, so I have to explain quite often to my colleagues as well why I'm actually engaging in discussions around offsets. Um, this should be pretty self-explanatory now. There's three buttons. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, thanks. Um, I think one key thing, like I said, poverty reduction, but at what cost and in what kind, what kind of context, right? And I think we, we all agree that conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services are key for people's livelihoods. So any kind of development needs to happen within that context. Um, and then there's the central role of government, and I think that is, I think very often when we're talking CSR, we're talking biodiversity conservation, we're talking... Uh, extractive industry, sustainable development, we leave out the role of government. And I think here, again, and it has been said, but the, st the stewardship of natural assets is the responsibility of governments. So they have a, an essential role to play, and we cannot get anywhere if we do not have governments on board. Um, they need to be involved, uh, and any kind of scheme of no net loss or net gain needs to be included in a plan, a national plan. Um, because, also because that creates the security and continuity that is needed. Um, but, and I think we've, we've already has been said as well, governance is obviously a key issue. What we see everywhere, um, I do a lot of work in the Congo Basin, it's an issue in Liberia, the issue of conflicting land use, over, overlapping permits, forestry, mining, oil, protected areas, uh, by, um, palm oil concessions, <coughs> red concessions. Um, they're all defined by different ministries that do not talk to each other. There's very little uh, cadastre management, land use planning. Um, and then we're not even talking cross-border landscapes that came up just now as well. So how can we facilitate some kind of planning that takes into account all these different kind of interests uh, from different parties and how can we get all these different parties around the table? And I think that's where we have, I hope we have a role to play and that's why we'd like to come in and we think we have a role to play in this debate. Um, cum well, cumulative impacts. I think that was mentioned this morning as well, the fact that you cannot just talk about offsets without talking about watershed management, water, other, other kind of natural resources, ecosystem services again. Um, how can we talk on a landscape level? How can we bring different parties around the table? It's all nice to talk with one mining company, but if, if they have a palm oil concession next door and a paper mill on the other side, 
how can we talk and get those different parties to talk together about their impacts and how to offset those and create some kind of net gain. Um, then specifically just, oh, sorry. Mining, I think, and that's, I mean, this is a similar map we've just seen of Mongolia, we've seen of Namibia, I think it's everywhere. I think the big issue with mining is that you cannot say, oh, it's not convenient to have a mine here, let's put it somewhere else. I mean, it's stating the obvious, but it is a key issue. So we're, it's not really a choice. It's not that you're gonna mine there because you have a license to trash, you're gonna mine there because that resource is there, and we're talking very poor countries that need to develop. So we're gonna have to talk about how to do that, for one, how to do that with a minimum amount of loss, but then about how to offset loss. I think we're sort of past the debate whether offsetting is good or not. It has to happen because those mines are there and they're gonna develop and we're not gonna tell poor countries and I totally agree there's certain no-go areas that we really should not touch upon. Uh, but there's a lot of other places that, where those minerals are there. And like, I mean, Liberia has a great potential and they have a desperate need to develop economically. Um, but how can we do that in an organized way and help those governments develop a plan um, to do that, to, to set up an offset scheme that works. And I think the big advantage we have in Liberia is that we have a government that has asked us to assist helping them uh, develop a no net or develop a scheme or a national biodiversity offset scheme. And we're working with quite, we have quite a few mining companies that are very keen to talk to each other for one, which is already a very positive step, and to coordinate and who have also asked us uh, to see what we can do uh, to engage and to come up with some kind of national aggregated system. And with that... Thank you, Kirsten. I think I probably skipped the slide. No, no, don't worry. You need the left, the left, yeah. Has it left, right, yeah. okay. Um, I'm just very briefly gonna to touch on this, but there are very significant limitations in a Liberian context to project-specific offsets. A lot of the charismatic fauna, like forest elephants, which have gone from 19,000 to 1,000 in Liberia, and we're not even sure that there is actually 1,000, require very large landscapes. A lot of project-specific arts that aren't going to address cumulative impacts, they're probably going to be too small, they're going to be disconnected, there's going to be large edge effect. And I really think, specifically, and I don't want to apply this everywhere, but in a Liberian context, an aggregated offset system really makes a lot more sense. When we started off this process and I created this slide, I was trying to sort of symbolize the fact that many things have to come together simultaneously for an aggregated offset system to work. And as part of the process, we looked at how could this system be funded? <coughs> who would manage it? What are the institutional legal policy framework that is it there? Do we have to implement something new? What are the opp uh, opportunities for gazetting areas? What sites are there that mining companies could gazette into? <coughs> and we uh, looked at the sort of methodological challenges, no net loss metrics, etc., and also absolutely fundamentally in a country who's a, a fragile state who's come out of 13 years of civil war and there's a very very serious issue over land rights and um, tension about uh, what actually constitutes a, um, a community deed a tribal land certificate who owns the land does the does the Liberian government really own the land to, to give it uh, over to protected areas Liberia, since the 1970s, it harbors an extraordinarily uh, rich biodiversity. And since the 70s, many people have been looking and prioritizing you, the IUCN initially, and then FFI, CI. Numerous organizations have come in and, and done rapid surveys, more systematic surveys, and come up with a range of sites which they think are the key sites. However, as you can see from this, and this is so from the 1970s to now, we've managed to protect three and lost three. And so actually, Liberia is in a very, very difficult situation. And these sites, these sites which are purple, are absolutely extraordinary. They harbor the, the pygmy hippos, um, wonderful endemic plants, um, forest elephants, as I said, and many other uh, fantastic um, bird life as well and yet they're not going to be protected. It's taking so long for the government, just don't, doesn't have the resources to manage these sites. 
And so here we have an extraordinary situation where actually, if we're talking about additionality, we need to, we, the, the, when you're offsetting, you shouldn't really offset into an area that's already protected, that's already got management. Well, here we have a lot of sites that aren't protected. They're ready, they're ripe to go. We know they're very high value. We know that they have conservation priority. These are the areas that mining companies should be gazetting into, not a lot of individual, random, badly placed offsets. And I think what, what another extraordinary thing about Liberia is we know a lot about these sites, so much so that there was a national survey uh, recently done, of, uh, took two years, of chimps and large mammals. If we could put a square over virtually any part, we could tell you how many chimps are there, 200. So we can say, you're losing 200 chimps here. And we can tell you in any of those blue sites roughly how many chimps are there. So we've got an incredible ability also to do like for like. And I think that is very unusual. We can match up sites. We can tell you which of those are a prior. You know, we can even number those sites and say which is richer than another site. So I, I think we're in a, an extraordinary position. Um, so the legislative framework is absolutely there now. I have to be careful when I say that. The word offset is, is not mentioned in the ESI legislation. However, uh, all of the mineral licenses now are going to require IFC performance standard six. And so any new mining project will have to produce an offset. So we're there from a mining sector. We're not there from an oil palm sector or forestry sector, which actually are having uh, also profound impacts in the Liberian um, context. So we've got PPAs to link into. We know a lot about them. We could do like for like. We could do additionality. And knowing our sites in advance, we're not waiting for them to come to bear. They're there, ready for us. And that's why I've, uh, well, why we've started to consider some sort of credit system. However, as in life, challenges and... Uh, <coughs> Kirsten showed a fantastic map of the mineral concessions. Here are the forestry concessions. Um, and I haven't put palm oil on here, which is a whole other layer. And if you put the three layers on top of each other, there's not a lot of space, to be honest. Um, luckily, forestry, because forestry has this dual role of conservation and commercial, conservation doesn't really get a lot of look in, um, they actually, for the most part, uh, have avoided the protected areas, but obviously the mineral concessions in palm oil don't have the same agenda. So just going back, um, land tenure is a very, um, a, very, a very serious issue, and also Liberia has a very unusual dependency on, on bushmeat. Uh, over 75% of the rural population, um, I would almost say, are just almost totally dependent on bushmeat. They very rarely even eat chickens or other things. And so you've got a, an issue there when you're protecting an area. What, what are the impacts going to do? What are going to be on these local communities? So you've got to work things out about alternative livelihoods and what does that actually mean? Um, and so that's, that's something we've got to work on and we are working on. And some of the emerging lessons from protected areas in Africa generally one of the biggest failings is not tackling the human dimension of it. So, um, thank you very much. But I'm very hopeful. Um, I, maybe I'm naive. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kristen and Sally. Uh, can we eat into about 10 minutes of uh, your coffee break? Is that acceptable? Uh, even if it's not, you can step out on your own. But I would imagine there's some questions. Somebody's already got their hand up in the back, so you go first. Um, but if we can get the rest of the panel kind of up here uh, and uh, come into the limelight. Um, <laughs> it's, it's awful. <laughs> uh, and, and we'll take some questions uh, from the audience, please. Oh, thank you very much for those presentations. My name is Katya Karousakis, and I work at the OECD in the Environment Directorate. Um, this afternoon from PIPA and from the World Bank and also from the morning, there were a lot of presentations that highlighted the importance or the, benefit, the benefits of a mapping through GIS or other systems. And I was wondering, based on your experiences in the field, if you have any uh, indications of how much it actually costs to do these kind of mapping exercises. 
Um, obviously, you know, it will depend on scope, but if you can provide any indications on how much it costs to do something like that, I think that would be of interest to other countries or regions that are interested in, in doing similar, similar mapping exercises. Thanks. I don't know. Should we just all go? Um, well, it depends on what... So not a, the answer you want, maybe, but it depends on the, the mapping exercise you want to do. I mean, some of the stuff that, that I put up was uh, just freely available open access satellite imagery. So you just pay for someone's time to do that, assuming they can do that. Um, so that's cheap. But if you want high resolution stuff to do microsighting, that's a different matter. And if you want, for instance, to buy um, um, inf spatial information on the um, oil and gas infrastructure, that can be quite expensive. So I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. I, but I do think that, that, that using mapping, especially for the landscape scale context, is crucial and it's something that we need to do more of. Yeah, I'd just say relative to the investments going in, when you see all those maps of leases, it's tiny, tiny amount of money for the benefit of the planning that you would have. I think Jonathan Bailey um, made a comment this morning around the incredible power or the, or the, the potential of remote sensing and, and that there is a lot more data coming out into the open market and it's getting, it is getting cheaper but you do need to have people have the skills to be able to interpret that. Um, and when you're looking at this kind of landscape um, scale assessment and planning, you, you do need you do need to build scenarios and you have to understand what is going on. So time time frames, good 10, 20 years to understand the background degradation, you know, what future changes are likely to happen is actually a very important part, not only just a snapshot in time. Uh, one of the massive kind of gifts into this um, Namibian um, project that we were involved in was a data set from the University of Hamburg. And that was essentially, well, I think it was 35 years of somebody's painstaking field work. And that essentially was the building block of, of, of what we were able to do in that landscape. But that doesn't come cheap, um, I don't think. One sort of remark, and I agree that mapping is crucial, but I also do think sort of a word of caution that I think we often spend a lot of time and energy at painstakingly mapping out everything. And then in the end, nobody uses it because government don't, don't know how to use GIS or don't have or are not interested in GIS. We see different ministries using different maps and a Ministry of Mines happily giving out mining concessions that overlap with protected areas, etc. So I think we should probably start at the basics first before and then, then yes, there's detailed mapping that's needed. But I think we also sometimes should start with the basics first. Okay, sorry, I, Lorraine, you're next. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Carol Stephan Golder Associates. Um, Pippa addressed one of the, the points I was thinking about, it, and this landscape level planning when you have all these overlapping interests. Um, the, one of the, the criticisms is that perhaps all that's left will be what's protected, and that may not be what we want to protect as offsets or protected areas. Conversely, some of the areas that are protected areas may in fact not be the best areas for conservation. So in your experience, I'm just curious at this landscape level planning, where, what would be the direction you would go or what's the direction you're advising? Um, I think you saw that we kind of stripped naked the land in, land, in, in Namibia, which is a, a wonderful thing to be able to do, taking off all the boundaries of, of protected areas and, and, and then replace that to understand just what the constraints or the opportunities would be. Um, I know that the, you know, Sanbi, for example, uh, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Sanbi, but I'm in not, you know, they have an incredible mapping system and, and understanding of, of the biodiversity of South Africa. They have, they know what's in and outside of the protected areas network too. And I think the opportunities really are in taking a fundamental um, approach to understanding the biodiversity and ecosystems of a country, and I think that's what Colombia is also trying to do, is to find at a, at a, at a grosser scale, and, and that one that is able to actually identify values that cross boundaries or cross, cross the, the, the defi definitions of protected areas or not, to, to actually make sure that we do know what we need to value and what the, what the vulnerability of those areas are. And, and I think that's, that's, 
what we have to answer, otherwise we'll end up mining or, or putting palm oil plantations or, or kind of soy or whatever it is over, over stuff that really sh could be part of, of what creates a tipping point, an ecological tipping point, that is. Any other panel members want to respond to that? Or should we have a question? You have the microphone, I believe. Shell. So I'm, I, I'm interested in um, offsets for management actions. So we heard about the antelope in um, Mongolia. Uh, Mon Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. <laughs> Close. Um, I get that a lot, don't worry. Where the key, the key threat was poaching. Now, in, in Canada, one of the pieces of uh, federal legislation, the Fisheries Act, is now, has been rewritten and is now, it, it, it identifies the offsets as needing to be orientated around the key threat to the species. So in this case, you know, poaching. And a parallel is caribou in Canada. So, and caribou exist on the, on the same landscape that we have um, oil and gas development. And the key threat to the species is not the amount of land. The amount of land that's disturbed is quite low. It's not the amount of food. You fight, you catch a caribou, they're not skinny, they're nice and fat. Um, it's not, you know, other things, really what it is, it's not poaching, it's wolves. Now, the oil and gas industry can't go around and, and kill wolves. Apart from it not being socially acceptable, we're not allowed to do that. So what can we do? And we're very limited in terms of, like, protected areas. We have done some things like penning of, uh, of mothers and calves until they're a certain number of weeks old. But it's incredibly expensive. We basically have to have armed guards around the clock to protect these caribou and their calves, and even then, some of them don't make it. But anyway, that's a, a long story. What I'm interested in is where there's a, a limitation around making new protected areas that you can basically put a fence around and say you've protected that. On a working landscape, what experience does the panel have or other people have of um, offsets manage, that use management, that are based on management actions to protect or to address the key threat to the species. I have some experience of that in the UK or in Europe, things like um, uh, field margins, where you pay farmers not to spray the edge of a field or, or to pay them to use less pesticides. Now, how can we extend that into uh, addressing key threats to species and making those into offsets? And how do you quantify those? Because those are some of the things that we're gonna have to do in Canada because we just don't have the ability to make these new protected areas to address our impacts. Yeah, if anybody has... I mean, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of potential in management actions for species for this, but um, I think the key thing is to be... You've got to be so careful, obviously, about what, what your counterfactual is. I mean, you need to be able to really demonstrate that there would have been a loss of, of that species without the management action, which is where you start, obviously, to get some difficulty. But in, theoretically, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the example that, that I gave is, is one where, yeah, it's, it's directly using management actions to, to prevent losses and thereby argue kind of no net loss. Um, there have been a lot of proposals, I think, for species-based management actions. There are some really interesting ones in, in marine ecosystems, actually, um, looking at kind of removing invasive predators from controversial because people like to lose seabirds. But I think there's a lot of stuff out there. I think that's something we're, we're going to have to um, look at more and more is, is, um, is a quantified way of demonstrating gains in, in species conservation as a way of offsetting losses. I, as for the answer to how to <laughs> protect caribou from wolves, I'm, I'm not sure if that's, a, that's an interesting one. I'm not sure that we should be guarding caribou from wolves. That's a, <laughs> especially for an oil and gas company, that seems slightly bizarre. But. Is anybody in the panel familiar with the uh, proposed offsets for Oyu Tolgoi in Mongolia? Yeah? Pippa or Bruce, you want to talk about that? Um. Looking at sort of the, I think it's the four key species in Mongolia, one of which is the, the hulan, the, the wild ass, the goited gazelle, and the hubara bust, we'll talk about those three. Um, a number of conservation actions, things from flight diverters on power lines to underpasses on road systems to allow the migratory uh, routes to be undisturbed, um, and anti-poaching measures, uh, in, improvement for was, was pastoralists around improving the pasture quality and the, and the habitat. So quite a number of management actions. It's, 
There is this misperception, I think, that an offset re requires a hectare for a hectare, or a hectare for two hectares, or, or whatever it might be. And actually, the additionalities that you can achieve through action, the conservation actions, um, are, are, are really in the mix and have to be uh, you know, serious, and, and very often are, are the only option, and in fact, are, are more important from a conservation perspective than um, you know, putting a, a fence around. But I would really caution you to interfere with predator-prey models <laughs> in um, that, you know, controlling wolves, and there's got to be something wrong in the, in the, in the request from a government that asks you to do that. Or oh, whoever. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll take we'll take uh, two more questions. We'll take uh, oh no, Raulio, yeah, I already promised to you, and and then uh, Susie. Thanks. Uh, Sally mentioned the issue of uh, bush meat, and I want to use this uh, to ask uh, a question of uh, all of you: are uh, how do you deal with this issue? So. Many poor communities in developing countries are totally dependent on access to, nat to forests and either public lands or community-based lands for their uh, food and other uh, natural resources for survival. So uh, you mentioned about the need to uh, find some uh, alternatives for that, but is that really the, the way out to find alternatives or to plan uh, into the, the uh, the decision making in terms of land use in whatever uh, protected areas or other set asides that, that are being planned. So I just wanted to, to ask for more ideas, not only from Sally, but uh, from the others in terms of how to deal with this kind of issue, which is a very common one. So people, it's not just about land rights, it's, it's right for access to natural resources in other areas. And the, for which these uh, local communities are very dependent on. Can I just answer? Um, Actually, before you respond, let's take uh, Susie's question, then we'll wrap questions from the audience, and then we can respond to both questions, please. Right here. Thank you. Yeah, where it touches on it. Thank you, Susie Brownlee. Um, we've heard about SEAs from Pippa, and, and Kerry and Michael talked quite a bit about the approach to coming up with a no net loss or an offset kind of policy. But I was going to ask for experience about trying to embed this kind of planning into formal land use or sector plans and trying to encourage a, a much more strategic environmental approach or environmental and social approach that actually brings all these competing, if you like, sectors into one accepted and aligned uh, blueprint where, in a sense, you, you're holding future areas that, that could be offsets. I'll, t well, I'll take Susie's question. Um, I mean, I think that's, in the case of Mongolia, um, I think a good sign to us is that we're being funded by the Ministry of Land Use Planning and Ministry of Environment. We have a... a <coughs> agreement across a number of ministries. So the uptake of the work, I think, is apparent. And if they're going to fund it, I hope they use it. Um, but I mean, it's always, a ch I think the challenge goes beyond that. Somebody mentioned about the difficulties then of kind of capacity within government then to make an implementation system work and getting the balance right between something that is scientifically defensible, but also practical and implementable for, you know, um, the, the, where the country is with its regulations and implementation. The, the experience in Namibia was one where the, uh, the strategic environmental assessment was essentially uh, overseen. There was a governing body, a steering committee, which comprised, I think there were nine different ministries. So it had everybody from agriculture, fisheries, to mining and energy, environment, uh, to the state uh, kind of strategic planning unit. Um, so it, it was, you know, really important, and that um, it, it's a decision support tool. And, and I think Kirsten points out this is not the answer to all ills, and, and certainly not to all problems. But if that is used in the right way, and those ministries, through an interministerial committee and through a consensus and, and, and consultation process, which really has to be embedded within the way that the government um, constitution demands full consultation on, on big decisions like that, 
then you, you have the possibility of those being useful and planning happening in the way that it should. Um, there will be trade-offs and there have to be compromises and, and each of those ministries needs to understand that, you know, if you want, if you want a coastal, I mean, Namibia's got a national park that stretches the entire length of the coast, but we know that mining happens on it. We know fisheries are overfished. Um, there's sorts of potassium phosphate mines going on. It's not, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not all worked out, but it's the beginning of a system which has the potential to work. But I agree with you, you have to ask a whole lot more people than just one or two. Um, Susie, I can add an example from Victoria of a, um, uh, an aggregated offset that came entirely through the planning system. So this involved uh, a rezoning in Melbourne of some four and a half thousand hectares for um, residential development. And the, um, the arrangement was that there would also be, as part of that package, uh, a rezoning of 12,000 hectares of, uh, of land that would, would, over a period of 25 years, form the offset for the impacts on the, the rezoned residential land. Um, and it, it involved also a rolling fund so that as the, as the residential land was developed, um, the, the money for the offsets would go towards the acquisition of the, of the land within the conservation zone and that then would go, go back into public ownership. And after, after um, when we get to the 25 years, we'll have a, um, a new 12,000 hectare protect area. So, and it's all done within, basically within the um, land use planning scheme that applies to, uh, to Melbourne. Uh, so we unintentionally jumped over a question. So if we can get to that, please, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Just on the, the question of alternative livelihoods, a, a lot of work has been done in some of the proposed protected areas, a lot of consultation with local communities, and the reality is, is, is those proposed protected areas or stroke offsets, whatever they may turn out to be, are, it, the most likely outcome would be they would be co-managed with the local communities. I don't think there is any other way forward. In fact, I think it would be a bad idea if if there were any other outcome. Now, will that will that, and and there may be certain areas within the forest where they can um, take bush meat and perhaps others where they can't. Ca can one guarantee that the reduction in bush meat hunting um, is going to drastically reduce? I, d I genuinely don't know the outcome, but what I do know is that those areas won't be gazetted, and. So you're buying yourself a little bit of time. They're not going to be turned into palm oil concessions because once the legislation is over those sites, uh, they, they can't be changed unless by unless taking it to the president. So um, I'm not sure there is an easy answer, and I know some alternative livelihood projects have been um, have failed. And just on the issue of land use planning, two words, um, just because. I think land use planning is key, but it's also, I think there are so many different parallel processes. I mean, almost every single Central Afl African country is doing a land use planning process right now, partially because of their, they're preparing for, for a red, red plus. And everybody's doing SEAs for EU projects, for World Bank projects, whatever, but I, I think most of them do not take into account the, the biodiversity. The, it's a different set of consultants, if you like, that attend different conferences. No, but really, I mean, there's, there's so many parallel processes going on, and, and somehow one of the things we do need to do, and I think it was the messages this morning, is try to integrate this mm -hmm. and make sure the whole management of natural resources, no matter what, becomes one integrated policy approach somehow. Sorry. Let's go. Cool. Just on, on the livelihoods side, there's just, sorry, Kerry, just there Bounds is. Bound to be brief. Uh, <laughs> Bound to be brief. There are enormous parallels to, to, to learn from the Red Plus and Red Plus Plus processes in terms of, of making sure community benefits are, are there. Yeah. Hey, Kerry, did you want in? 
to yes. say anything? Uh, to very yourself? super briefly, if I may, on this issue of um, livelihoods and sustainable use and Braulio's question, a couple of colleagues have already touched on it. I think there are two key points. One is what do we actually mean by the scope of the losses that we're trying to offset? And if, for example, you have a mining project, I, I worked on one in Ghana, where um, not only was there the sort of loss of intrinsic biodiversity values, but local people could no longer access medicinal plants in the area of the mine footprint. So the offset was conceived to replace those medicinal plant values in one way or another, whether that's through herbaria or medicines, it doesn't matter. But the point is, those are biodiversity values that are being lost. They're cultural and socioeconomic values, but they're, they're comprised in no net loss of biodiversity. And then the other point about the livelihoods is, um, there are different ways to deliver offsets. And we've talked about um, a couple of colleagues in their big pastoral examples and the um, Central Europe and Central Asia and Mongolia have talked about rangeland management. There's a great deal that we can done just by improving the quality of conservation management on land. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to put that land under protected areas, although that's often a very good option. But things that are the analogy of payments for ecosystem services schemes that pay pastoralists local communities to manage better, to deliver the conservation outcomes that you need for the offset, can really help contribute to sustainable livelihoods, and I think are an important part of the package of getting to no net loss. Great. Well, uh, let's start, put our hands together for the panel. Thanks so much for your contribution. I certainly feel like I got around the world today. Uh, <laughs> please enjoy some coffee. Sir, excuse me, for those of you who intend to 